What's up guys, it's Kaiser here. So, I wanted to take a look back at the Royal Rumble 2007 match. It's one of the most non-talked about Royal Rumble matches, and it's actually one of my favorites. I love how it ended. I actually like this whole pay-per-view. It's a very underrated pay-per-view people don't talk about, but it was pretty lit, I'm not gonna lie. It had the Hardys versus Eminem. It had John Cena versus Umaga. Like, it was a very star-studded event. I just, I never really hear it talked about. The winner of this Rumble match was actually The Undertaker, and he went on to face Batista at WrestleMania 23. That match is a definite classic. I watched it live. It was, it felt so cool in the moment to watch it because you didn't know who was going to win. I'm like, really, Undertaker could lose right here. The streak wasn't this big spectacle that they had in the later years where like just going against the Undertaker to try and beat the streak was enough to sell tickets. But at the same time, he was 14 and 0 at this point. That was enough to build some intrigue. Like, oh wow, he could break the streak, but Undertaker could win this World Heavyweight Championship. This was actually the last match before they super started focusing on Undertaker's streak and who's gonna be the one to break it. It's real star-studded as well. You got Randy Orton, you got Edge, as rated RKO, you got Shawn Michaels in here, Punk, and you got Benoit. So this Rumble is pretty important, and I see why they don't really talk about it as much, just because the year before you had Rey Mysterio kind of attributing his win to Eddie, and the year after you had John Cena returning from surgery within like four months when he was expected to be out for like six to eight. So that definitely took a lot of attention away from what happened in between those two matches. But yeah, no, this was a great match. So let's not waste any more time. Let's check it out. All right, so our first two entrants, we got Ric Flair and Fit Finley, but he's just Finley. So Ric Flair at this point is about a year out from his retirement or his first retirement, I should say. So at this point in his career, he was pretty much just floating around the mid card. Like I get why they kept him on television just cause it's Ric Flair. That's definitely a name that's gonna sell some tickets. But for the most part, he wasn't doing too much, but you know, He's helping out, he's selling some tickets, you know? Finley, on the other hand, has had a few programs at this point with like Batista, with The Undertaker, and this was actually shocking at the time. Like I was too young to understand what or who Fit Finley was. So I only ever knew him as this character, Finley. And so next in the match, Kenny Dykstra appears and I don't have any gripe against Kenny Dykstra. I just forget how often he was featured on WWE television at the time. He comes in and you'd think the younger talent's gonna get some shine against these two older legends in the ring. Nah, they kind of kick his ass. That's kind of been WWE's thing for quite some time like if there's legends in the ring the younger talent's usually gonna get squashed or get jobbed out or something silly nowadays i see a lot of wrestling promotions actually using older legends to put over younger legends and i appreciate that so much like it was so reversed for so long this is definitely the right way to go about it. So after Kenny Dykstra, we have Matt Hardy. He's still a little banged up from his match earlier against Eminem. Uh, and then directly after Matt Hardy, we have Edge. And that's where I see why Matt Hardy was in the ring. So Edge hits a few people with some spears and then inevitably eliminates Ric Flair. Kenny Dykstra got eliminated, by the way. So after Edge, we get Tommy Dreamer. And I always forget that ECW used to actually be a part of these rumbles. And they, at some point, had a stake in this too. I never thought that anyone on the ECW roster would win just because, I mean, it's ECW to main event WrestleMania. In the mind of Vince McMahon, that's an ignorant thought. So yeah, number seven, we have Sabu. Oh, and he completely botches a springboard DDT off the ropes to Tommy Dreamer. So before Sabu gets in a ring, he introduces a table ringside, and we'll see if that comes into play. Okay, so next, stay in the back. It's Shane Helms. So Shane Helms goes straight for Matt Hardy. I guess they had a feud brewing around this time. Seemed intense because they were going at it. I mean, to the point where Edge kind of just stepped aside. Okay, so the ring is getting pretty full. And this is exactly what I said in my last video where I said a powerhouse or a baby face would come through and clear the ring out just a little bit. So here we have Kane. 
So Kane comes in and immediately eliminates Tommy Dreamer. And you know that table I was talking about earlier? Yeah, it was a table for one. And it was Sabu's table for one. So next out we have CM Punk and this is actually his first Royal Rumble match. Now, I was one of those fans who was disappointed when he left the WWE in 2014. So I actually watched his last Rumble match live and just during the whole match, it seemed like something was off for him. I was a huge fan of him and you could tell something was off. So to hear that he walked out the very next day on Raw kinda knew something was gonna happen. I didn't expect it to take 10 years for him to come back, but I definitely think it's poetic as hell that he's coming back at the Rumble exactly 10 years after he left in the Rumble. I'm actually team punk this saturday so we'll see what happens so we get king booker coming out and even though i could not stand king booker with a passion as a kid i now as an adult understand how a work works and you know he was working us you know he was just doing his job and i could never be upset at somebody doing their job but man i could not stand king booker and all hell king booker oh my god that was like just that line alone just gave me chills i hate that line absolutely great heel heat though for sure so randy orton enters the match and edge is still in the ring as well so rated rko was in full effect at this point they together actually eliminated the hardys and let's take a second to realize how great rated rko was couldn't stand them i was a huge dx fan but the fact that they maybe they these guys really made me care as a kid and that's what a good heel is so i'm always shout them out for that just because like their goal is to make you feel something and i definitely wanted to see some guys win more because other guys were making it difficult for them to win not to mention these guys put on some bangers with degeneration x like unforgettable matches Especially, we remember when Triple H tore his quad and had to, he continued the match and it was still, a, in my opinion, five star match. Man, anybody remember Kevin Thorne? What on earth? So Chris Benoit was in the ring. He came in at number 17 and he's in the corner going at it with CM Punk and it's kind of eerie because Punk was actually going to face Benoit the night he no showed and we found out what happened so it's a little weird to just see them interacting just a few months before it all transpired Shawn Michaels enters the match and boy it was a time to be alive when Shawn Michaels was an active wrestler like man you could guarantee you were gonna care about something not only that but you could guarantee you're gonna get a banger of a match so the plan this year was actually for Triple H to face John Cena in a rematch at Wrestlemania but like I said with Triple H tearing his quad it kind of took him out of the match which is where Shawn Michaels came in and took his place so Shawn Michaels versus John Cena at Wrestlemania 23 in my opinion is one of the most underrated WrestleMania main events that I can think of, definitely within the 2000s. And I think it's because John Cena was entering Super Cena status, so nobody really wanted him to win. It was kind of like how they treated Roman Reigns, where everybody knew he was going to win, but nobody wanted that. But man, that does not take away from the match that those two had at WrestleMania. It was so good, man. And then they also followed it up with a one hour long match on Raw on free television and it was even better than i would say the main event of wrestlemania on free television like they gave that to us just because they were really trying to get cena over now did this work it depends on who you ask for me at the time i didn't mind john cena but i definitely wanted Shawn michaels to win these matches even though not everybody liked john cena we did all collectively respect him as a main eventer so i would say it did work in my opinion so Shawn michaels is coming in hot he immediately eliminates finley who's been in the match the whole time so shout out to finley at that age i'm sure that was no easy task then he helps eliminate viscera and and right after that he takes out sheldon benjamin this is what i'm talking about i literally love when they do this when a, a star just comes down the ring and just eliminates a group of people in my opinion this sells the match more just because it makes sense these guys are exhausted they've been in the ring a lot longer and here comes a fresh superstar to almost immediately ruin everything they just worked for that whole match and what this does 
because for me is it sells how important your entry number is like if you got a low number and you win for me that sells it just because you've been in the ring for over an hour the 29 other people that were in the match and you win for me that sells it that's a well-earned royal rumble win like when they had ray do it when they had Benoit do it, when they had Sean do it. And it's always the smaller guys. It's never like the bigger guys. So that's pretty cool. So the Great Khali enters at 29 and I continuously forget just how much they were pushing him. Like he gets in and he's immediately eliminating people. He's he's giving face chops to all the superstars we know and love. He's just going in. So Undertaker enters at number 30 and he inevitably eliminates the great Kali by himself like undertaker was the only superstar that that sold the face chops but didn't fall from them and he was the only one whose punches affected the great Kali. and he by himself actually eliminated the great Kali. so nice to see there was some level that the great Kali couldn't mess with you know what i mean like because he was taking out all the stars we know and love in this era like john cena he took out Rey Mysterio. He was giving Batista problems. And just to think he'd be a comedy character, not even three years later. So Undertaker gets rid of the Great Khali and he takes out MVP as well. Once MVP is eliminated, he introduces a steel chair and the refs don't let him use it, but Randy Orton gets a hold of it. And this is the last few months that they were allowing chair shots to the head. So we get to the final four and this is where it becomes one of my favorite matches because we have rated RKO and we have Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker left over. And this essentially turns the match into a short fatal four way. And that's where it gets interesting to me because we just got a whole rumble match and now we've got a fatal four way and it's consisting of my two favorite baby faces versus my two favorite heels. Now Edge is setting either Randy Orton or Undertaker up for a spear. You can't really tell because Orton's standing in front of Undertaker, but it's not a good look considering they're tag team partners and tag team champions. So while they're arguing over what just transpired, Randy Orton hits the ultimate subject change and RKO's Shawn Michaels out of nowhere. While this is going on, Undertaker's most likely somewhere bleeding. And I say this just because the chair shot wasn't that clean to the head that he'd be bleeding profusely. But he is. He is. Yeah, but then they give him another one and that one actually hit for real. God. So Randy RKO starts focusing on The Undertaker for a few more minutes. In fact, they're about to give him a concerto facing up. This usually means the concerto is not going to happen, by the way. Shawn Michaels finally wakes up from that RKO nap. They both try to attack Shawn Michaels and he chucks Randy Orton over the rope. And then he also sends Edge over the top rope. This leaves Taker and Shawn. And Shawn falls after he chucks over Edge. So they're both lying on their backs. And Undertaker does his famous sit up. And Shawn Michaels does his famous kick up. And now we've got a one on one match. And these guys give us a taste of what we're going to see two years down the line at WrestleMania 25. And these guys just go at it like they're actually hitting signatures. Shawn Michaels tunes up the band and hits Undertaker with a sweet chin music. Undertaker's doing the snake eyes into the big boot, which Shawn Michaels always sells amazingly. So after hitting an elbow drop and then a sweet chin music, Shawn goes for another sweet chin music to get Taker out the mat and Taker reverses that and just kind of gives Shawn a back suplex out of the ring. So all in all, this was a really good match. It definitely doesn't deserve to be as forgotten as it seems to be. I do find ironic that Taker wins the match and the Royal Rumble's big sell is, oh, you get a main event spot at WrestleMania. And Sean was actually the one that main evented that year's WrestleMania. And I will say that as far as setting up for storylines moving forward, they didn't really do that too much here. This was really like a time capsule of what WWE was in 2007. Like it's a great representation, just the people that they showed throughout this whole match. And they had a pretty deep roster they had a pretty good main event scene but their mid card was struggling and it seems like every time they had a baby face in the mid card they would push him to the main event like you had jeff hardy you had Rey mysterio the miz was actually in this match for about two seconds but four years later he ended up main eventing wrestlemania so as far as keeping solid stars in the mid card this is the time where the dark ages started to happen and the mid card was almost non-existent and you pretty much just watched the show for what was going on in the main event granted it was some great stuff in the main event but like aside from that 30 minutes of the show you're just not really invested in 
the other things going on but hey guys i appreciate the love and support like you guys have been awesome i'm gonna keep working as much as i can i really put in a lot of work to be able to get this video done before the royal rumble so hopefully you guys enjoy it so please like subscribe hit that notification button if you can we gonna be rocking all 2024 put that seatbelt on and until next time keep it cozy